looking at student data in regards to math and literacy, um, beginning of the year, middle of the year, and end of the year. Um, so with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Caressis, who's sitting in for Superintendent Dr. Williams Knight tonight. Thank you, Vice President Scott. Um, board members want to share with you that you received an updated PowerPoint uh, that is in your email uh, earlier. So you'll want to check that if you want to have a copy visible to you right in front. Otherwise, you can certainly check out the screen momentarily. Uh, Dr. Williams Knight uh, is on her way to Washington, D.C. for the Blue Ribbon Ceremony for National Schools of Excellence. As you're aware, City Honors is our third school receiving that designation since 2019, so we're certainly very proud of them. Uh, this year, they had the unique distinction of being the only school in Western New York to receive uh, that designation. So just incredible kudos to them uh, and to the team. And of course, the superintendent is looking forward to being part of that ceremony. For the data presentation tonight, introducing our Chief Academic Officer, Ann Botticelli, and also Director of Mathematics, Jadon Wagstaff. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for having us here tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about some of our goals for mathematics. Um, and I hope everyone's willing to bear with me. I'm going to go into a little bit of detail about the particular goals. I know the board members are obviously familiar with them, but just in case the general public doesn't understand some of the goals, I will dive into those. And joining me again is um, Jadon Wagstaff, our Director of Mathematics. Next slide, please. So as always, um, we are moving on to the next level with one voice, one vision, and one mission. And we have five strategic goals established um, by the superintendent and the board. And so today we're going to be talking about eliminating achievement and opportunity gaps, as well as accessing educational excellence and accelerating learning. Next slide, please. So I'm not sure if you have this particular slide in your PowerPoint, but um, Jadon is going to talk us through a little bit of the mathematics that our grade six students are called to do on the state assessment. So good evening, everyone. I selected two problems um, at the request of Anne and Dr. Williams to talk about and show you what our sixth grade students are being asked to do on the assessment. So this first one is from 2017. It was item number three. I'll give you a chance to read it over and then I will tell you what the standard is that is being tested. So take a moment to read it over. So this item number three from 2017 aligns to a standard that says interpret and compute quotients of fractions and solve word problems involving division of fractions by fractions. So at the grade six level, for part of the test, they are able to use a calculator. This happens to be one of the items that you cannot use a calculator for, nor is it asking them to actually do the computation. It wants them to interpret what they are seeing. What does this model represent in terms of division of fractions? So not all of the standards at any of the grade levels simply ask for computation. Some of them ask for students to display their understanding by interpreting a picture explaining what they see and or telling if what is printed is right or wrong and why. Okay, so this is just one example of what it is they have to do on a sixth grade assessment. 
Now notice this involves all fractions, all fractional parts. And the standards that teach fractions start as early in, as third and fourth grade. Okay, so now we're going to go on to one from last year's assessment. Next slide, please. So this one I want you to take a look at, this time with a different lens. I will tell you what the standard is once I've given you a minute to read it, but I want you to think about what might students have done on this problem. So go ahead and look it over. Uh oh, the slide changed. So oh, go back, please, Admir. So this item is 2024, last year. Item number 20, which is on the first part of the test, which again means without a calculator. So the standard is find volumes of right rectangular prisms with fractional edge lengths. And it goes on to say in the context of real world or mathematical problems. So students had to simply find the volume of what they have said is a cube. So one, they have to know what a cube is. Two, they have to know how to find volume. And then they have to make the correct answer choice. The, cor the correct answer is C, 15 and 5 eighths. 35% of our students answered correctly. Now, here is the other end of that spectrum. 39% of our students gave the answer of B. What do you think, what do you all think are the misconceptions that they may have. Why would they not all have answered correctly? Any volunteers? Added. They added two and a half plus two and a half plus two and a half. Perez over here, got my math brain on. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, they added two and a half, two and a half, and two and a half instead of multiplying. So that's one misconception. Are there any other ways they could have gotten A or D that you can think of? They multiplied the top of the, they multiplied the uh, numerators and added the denominators to get answer D which would be 125 over six, or one, yeah, 125 over six. Okay. So they multiplied five times five times, five halves, two and a half, they multiplied the fives, got 125, but then they added the twos at the bottom and got six. So 125 over six simplified 20 and five, six, I think. So these are all what are considered plausible distractors. They actually 
come from mistakes that kids might make. What I want for you to know is that on the reference sheet that is provided, the formula for volume is on the reference sheet. There is a labeled picture that labels the length, the width, and the height. And the formula is there in the form of V equals LWH, L times W times H, or V equals base times height. So the formulas are there for them. The other thing I want you to know is that regionally, we were only at an 8% gap to the region. That means regionally, only 42% of the kids were proficient on this item. So they were given the formula. The picture is labeled. And they could not use a calculator to compute. They had to do it by hand. So both items that you just saw, the one requiring division, understanding of division of fractions and this volume problem, which required that they multiply three mixed numbers, are sixth grade skills. And again, students start learning fractions as early as third grade by the time they get to sixth grade, it is expected that they will proficiently use fractions, decimals, percents, as they've not yet learned to use integers, which are positive and negative numbers. Any questions, comments? Thank you for sharing. Thanks, Thank Jadon. You. You're welcome. It's a good exercise. So we asked Janan just to go over this a little bit because we're going to be talking about our sixth graders. Um, and this is the state assessment that has been selected for the goal um, that they're asked to achieve. So I'm going to go to the next slide, please, Admir. And we're going to talk a little bit about goal number two, which is numeracy. So this particular goal is the percent of economically disadvantaged grade six students. So um, again, we're using, we're targeting economically disadvantaged students, but we're at a different grade level than last year. Last year, we focused on grade three. This year for mathematics, we're looking at grade six. So that group of students um, who are proficient on the New York State grade six math assessment is going to increase from last year's score of 23.5% uh, to 26%. So last, the current seventh graders, when they were in sixth grade, scored, uh, the economically disadvantaged population scored at a 23.5% proficiency rate. So we're asking this year's sixth graders, a different cohort of kids, to achieve 26% proficiency. Okay, so just for, I know people in the audience haven't necessarily seen this before. So again, we're looking at proficiency on the state assessment at grade six. We're targeting the economically disadvantaged population of students at that grade level. We looked at last year's final results for that group in grade six, and we're asking that the kids um, this year, so the new sixth graders, um, improve on that tally by about two and a half percent. So we wanna see a gain of two and a half compared to where last year's sixth graders ended. Next slide, please. Just one more slide to show a little bit of context. So we've done this before with the third grade population, which are not our current fourth graders. This is our current group of sixth graders. So we went out for COVID um, when they were in grade one. So at that time, they would have been working on foundational numeracy skills. Then in grade two, they were remote, hybrid, a little bit of in-person. By grade three, again, still working on their foundational numeracy skills, and you heard Jadon say that they've started fractions at this point. Um, that was the year of Omicron with the COVID restrictions where you can only have so many, so much distance between each student, et cetera. And then a bit more normal when they're fourth, fifth, and sixth grade years. But the reason that's important is because a lot of their foundational mathematics skills would have been acquired during that strange stretch of COVID. So that will definitely have some impact on their performance as they go up through the grade levels. Because to learn division, decimals, and fractions, you need to have some of the basic skills you would have acquired in the primary grades. And again, fractions being introduced in third, they're very important. So by sixth grade, you're being asked to apply 
all the skills you've learned up to that point. So there's a lot of computational work going on in grades um, K through five. And then in grade six, they take those skills and begin to apply them to more complex problems. Did I say that correctly, Jadon? Yes, you did. All right, thank you. Um, so on the next slide, you can see our performance over the past few years on the state assessment. So there are two um, lines here. The blue line shows the students who are not economically disadvantaged. So you can see in 2018-19, prior to COVID, they achieved a proficiency rate of 44.5%. The following year, that dramatically impacted by COVID, they dropped to about 22% proficiency. Then in 21-22, that year of Omicron, they were up to about 34.8. The following year, 56.4% proficiency. And then they dropped last year to 47.5% proficiency. So those are the kids who are not economically disadvantaged if you're following along with that blue line. The green line represents students who are economically disadvantaged, which is the cohort that we are targeting. So in 2018-19, prior to COVID, they were at a 17.7% proficiency rate on the state assessment. 2021, they dropped to 5.3% proficiency. And then they made steady progress up over the next couple of years to 11 and a half, 19.9, and then last year, 23.5% proficiency. You can see that red dotted line leading to 26%. That is our target. So we need to take um, the current students. So last year's students ended at 23.5. We want this year's group to end at a minimum of 26% proficiency. Any questions about that slide? Yes, question. Um, what do you attribute the jump um, for non-economically disadvantaged students that wasn't reflected by economically disadvantaged students? And then it, it settles again. Do we have any idea of what happened? I mean, I don't necessarily. It's probably dependent on who was taking the test, how, how large the cohort was, because mm -hmm. um, there's obviously fewer students who are non-economically disadvantaged. Um, and they may have had a higher rate of taking the assessment one of those years? Just one of the years ago. Yeah. But instructional methods didn't change. No, in fact, this year our instructional methodology changed. So we've been using the same program all those years that you're looking at. We use the same mathematics curriculum. Um, and then this year we adopted real math, which is a brand new program. So this year you might see some fluctuation. But years past, um, we were actually using the same core program. Can you can compare the scores even though we change programs. They're comparable. So we're still achieving the same standards. We're still teaching okay, the same standards. The different materials. materials. Yeah. Different materials to achieve the same standards, but we're assessing the same standards so we can compare even though we use a different curriculum. So it, we might be able to see if maybe the curriculum made a difference because we're still comparing the same standard, correct? Yeah, it'd be difficult to tease some things out. I mean, so there's usually an implementation dip the first year of a program, typically. Like we, last year when we adopted the new reading program, we actually did not see a dip on dibbles, but we did see a slight dip um, otherwise. So the first year is always a little um, difficult to gauge, but I feel like we've done a lot of training. We're going to talk about that a little bit, but we've done a lot of training with the teachers. The program has strong reviews. So. Thank you. Okay, so the next slide, please, Emmy. So in order to achieve our main goal, um, the board has set several interim goals to reach. So reporting out on these goals will, will hopefully keep us on track, um, getting to our target state assessment. So interim goal 2.1 is connected to the iReady assessment, which is one of our internal assessments. We administer iReady grades K to eight, um, we just adopted it a few years ago, so we only have a short window of um, trend data. And we administer it three times a year, beginning, middle, and end. Jadon, briefly, what are the, um, I'm sorry, what are the strands that it assesses? It actually assesses the same domains that are written in our standards. But because it's adaptive, based on how the students perform in any one of the domains, they get more or less questions. And that's how it determines and pinpoints where they are beginning, middle, and end of year. 
So, so number 10. Year, thank you. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, just to say at the beginning of the year, they're being assessed on things they may not have been instructed on yet. Right. Okay. And you were going to, I'm sorry, you were going to name the domains? Um, there's number sense, numbers in base 10, operations, and then they, there are five domains for K to five, and then they change slightly when you hit middle school, which is sixth grade. Thank you. Um, so the target here, so last year's sixth graders, so the current seventh graders, um, the economically disadvantaged group ended at 20% proficiency. So this year we'd like this new cohort of sixth graders to end at 25% proficiency. So again, the seventh graders, when they were in sixth, the economically disadvantaged population had a 20% proficiency rate, and we're looking for the current sixth graders to achieve a 25% proficiency rate on the iReady assessment. assessment. So the, the goal here with having an interim is that it will help us stay on track um, as we monitor progress toward the main goal, which is based on the state assessment. Next slide, please. So again, we only had a few years worth of trend data available to us for iReady, um, but you can see the colors remain consistent. So the students who are not economically disadvantaged are in blue, and the students who are economically disadvantaged are shown in the green. So the first year of data we had was 2021-22. You can see our economically um, non-disadvantaged students started the beginning of the year at a 27%, made minimal gains by the middle of the year, but had a big leap by the end of the year to 38% proficiency. The following year, they started at 38% proficiency and increased to 53% by the end of the year. And in 23-24, which was last year, they started back down at 29% and increased to 46% proficiency. This year's group of non-economically disadvantaged students is starting the year at 30% proficiency. So that last dot that you see, the 30%. The red goal line shows that the target for us is 25% proficiency. So again, we want our economically disadvantaged students to achieve at minimum 25% proficiency on the iReady assessment. So if you go to the first year, um, 2021, you can see that group started at 4% and ended at 12%. Then the following year, they started a little higher at 6% and ended at 17%, which so they improved by about 5% from the previous year. Again, these are different students. It's the same grade level, but different students each time. In 23-24, that cohort started at 7%, which is slightly higher than the year before, and ended about 3% higher than the previous year, so they ended at 20%. So you could see gains between years of 5%, 3%, and this year um, we're looking to end at 25%, which is 5% higher than last year's cohort. So we're starting the year at 7%, same as last year. Any questions on the data? Yeah. I have a question. Me too. Go ahead, President Kotman. Okay, thank you. So I guess when I look at this, I'm so glad to see that, you know, we're monitoring it. But typically in business, we have short-term goals and long-term goals. Um, how do we, how do you ensure that this group of children will ever be at the level that the non-economically um, disadvantaged children are. In other words, are there any plans in place to push forward or to um, move these children in a bigger way um, to get them up to uh, a standard uh, that would be considered uh, decent and acceptable? Yes, yeah, so if you'll bear with me, on one of the uh, slides, a couple down the line, we're actually going to talk about what we're doing to improve um, results. Right, but but what my, my what what my fear is is that we put goals in place that we know we can attain, and we don't have stretch goals that maybe we stretch higher, harder, and 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 we don't achieve them, but at least we. We, we tried to reach them. That's all I'm asking, just that, that part. Okay, thanks, I'll wait. Okay. Um, 
Somebody else, I'm sorry, did someone else have a question? Yes, Ann, this is Cindy. Um, and I, I guess it kind of builds a little bit off of um, President Cotman's question, but it's just knowing that last year and this year are both starting at 7%, what, and I think you mentioned later slides, you're going to talk about you know, what you might be doing, but I guess my question is, what are you looking to do differently to have that added increase this year as opposed to last year, knowing that they're kind of starting out, the students scored the same way and the baseline showed us that, but I'm sure you'll probably get to it as you continue. I will, I'm gonna hit it on with Mr. Don's assistance on one of the other slides. Awesome. Okay, um, Adam, your next slide, please. So the second interim goal for mathematics is actually showing um, best way to describe it. I, I call it a growth goal. So what, instead of trying to reach proficiency, we're actually trying to cut down on the percent of students who are scoring at the lowest levels. Um, so in this particular instance, we want to reduce the students at level one. So again, we're looking at the IRAD assessment. It's the same population of dis, uh, economically disadvantaged grade six students. Um, and we would like to decrease the percent of students who are in that lower level. So last year's group ended at 58% in that lower level um, on the IRAD assessment. This year we want to cut that by 4%. So this group would end at 54. Hold Ideally on. we get higher than that. Board me. members, could you all make sure you're muted? We're hearing some tapping going on. Thank you. So obviously we'd prefer to have an even um, lower percent than 54, but that's the target set at the moment. Okay, next slide, please. So again, um, blue are the non-economically disadvantaged, green are the economically disadvantaged. So if you look at the students in blue back to 21, 22, you can see they have kind of inconsistent um, decrease at students performing well below benchmark. The next year was a more significant decrease from 36 to 23%. And then last year, they started a little bit higher, so there were more students who were below level, and they got down to 32%. So not as um, dramatic as the previous year, but better than the year two before that. This year, the group is starting at 42%. We'd like to get them to 54%. Oh, I'm sorry, backwards, that's the blue. Those are the kids who are on track, I apologize. The green is at 58%, we'd like to get 73%, we'd like to get down to 54. So I'm gonna try this again. The students in green on the top are the economically disadvantaged cohort we're focusing on. So two years, three years ago, they were at 79% down to 66. The next year, the trend continues from 76 to 62, and that, so that's 4% between the two years. Then 74 to 58, so that's another 4% between the 62 and the 58. This year, they're starting at 73, which is 1% lower than last year, and we'd like to drop them down to 54% um, as the goal. So we'd like to get down with that cohort to just um, under 54% proficiency, excuse me, in the lowest level. So we'd like to decrease the percent of students who are performing well below, while we're also increasing the percent of students who are performing at benchmark. Mm -hmm. So, Anne, these are all uh, this is a whole new cohort of kids, is that what it is? Yes, so each year you're looking at a different cohort of students in the same grade level. So the three years represent the sixth grade, but it's a different group of students. So this is how our sixth graders perform each year for the past three years. This incoming class is starting at 73%, below ben well below benchmark. So we want to reduce that percent to 54. Thank you. So if we go to the next slide, I can address um, Ms. McKetchen and Cotton's questions. So we're, both, we're doing some things to implement um, new programming and we're monitoring, which is key. We found over time that we can put things in place, but if we don't check that they are truly being implemented the way they're designed, it's not effective. So we need to make sure we're doing both. We train and implement, and then we monitor to make sure things are going successfully. So the first thing that we do is um, we have trained all the principals on the mathematics coaching tool, and we expect that they'll be using that in classrooms. 
So they go into classrooms on a weekly basis. They monitor mathematics instruction using the coaching tool, um, and they can give feedback to the teachers immediately. I am also visiting the schools with the school's ASL and Chief Jesenowski. Um, so fairly, fairly, I would say four to five times a week, we're in schools. Our focuses tend to be more on the reading end of things because Jadon and Kelly are coming along and following up doing a mathematics walk. So we've been very consistent. We're looking at reading instruction. We're looking at mathematics instruction. We're using the coaching tool, working with the administrative team so that we all see the same things and can debrief about supports that might be needed at the building level or things that are going really well that we might want to bring to other buildings. So we are very consistent going in, monitoring the mathematics instruction um, and making sure that we have feedback for the building and can support them. TOSAs in the, from the mathematics department can also go out and provide supports to the different schools. So schools can request that or they can be sent um, from central to the building. I mentioned we have a new math program called Reveal. That is a K-8 program. It addresses the same standards that we need to achieve, excuse me, but it's a different, um, it's a different tool than we've used in the past. Although we do still have things like first in math and uh, MobiMax. I'm gonna let Jadon talk for a minute about Alex. Oh, if she's still on the screen. Yes, there she is. Um, Alex is actually a slightly different component. It's not Reveal itself, but it is a diagnostic tool that we use. So Jadon, if you just wanna quickly talk about Alex. Alex is an adaptive self-paced program that tests students to see where they are in comparison to their grade level standards. So at the start of the school year, they take a diagnostic in Alex. It identifies all of the skills and or gaps that they need to fill as they progress through their grade level because it is connecting where there might be gaps to what they will be learning at their grade level. So it creates a plan for them that plan, again, is self-paced and adaptive. No child, no two kids will have the same plan. So spending time each week on Alex, students are working to fill gaps that may impact what they're learning at their grade level, if unfilled. So teachers can direct them to the domain they want them to work on and or students can work on any of the skills that are in their plan. Once they have completed 20 topics, which two to three topics can be done in 30 minutes. Once they've completed 20 topics and have spent five hours time on task, Alex will progress monitor. It will give them another short diagnostic to see if it needs to change the plan based on what they've learned in the topics that they've completed. So Alex is something that we have third through eighth grade teachers using with their students. We already have some students. Alex also produces, we call it a pie. It tells you how much progress the students have made because it begins to fill in from the center of the pie out towards each edge of it to let you know if the students are proficient with a standard and or a domain based on the work that they've completed in the system. We have students who have already, I know it's hard to believe because it's the beginning of the year, some students have already filled their pie because they have been working so diligently. So Alex is one of the ways we're trying to address what we looked at in that COVID chart, right? So we know that some of the kids had a different experience during the COVID years, um, and they may have stopped, like struggled a little bit with some of their foundational skills. Alex is going to help us catch those kids up while we're still moving forward with grade level standards through the main core program. So we're still teaching students the skills for the grade level but Alex can help us plug those gaps so that everyone can access the core instruction. Thanks, Janelle. 
We continue to provide professional development. So we have programmatic professional development. We've had a lot of teachers um, in the past month going to reveal and or Alex training to make sure that they understand the data reporting. Um, we continue to train teachers in numbers, which is sort of that foundational um, knowledge base that teacher needs, that theoretical understanding of mathematics. And we've been working with the principals. So we brought um, the company in to train the principals on Reveal and Alex at the last principals meeting, as well as the assistants, so that they felt more comfortable working with their teachers. And then I'm going to let Jadon talk for a minute about her professional learning communities. Um, it's a new initiative for us, and she's held two or three sessions so far. So this year we, um, last year we tried it. But Terry Shooter is your name on her head up after school. Terry Shooter has had her hand up. What? Terry Shooter has her hand up, I guess. Um, yeah, sh should we wait till the end to ask questions? Sure, that would be fine. Let's do that. So last year we tried PLCs with teachers, but we only um, tried it after school. This year, we have coined them MLCs, Mathematics Learning Communities. We have one that has been established for building administrators and another that has been established for teachers. So what we are doing is meeting once a month with the administrators. We are talking about what they will see in terms of content, topics, routines, manipulatives, all of those things for the following 30 days. So we met on Saturday and we talked about everything they will see for the next 30 days in grades K through eight by way of topics, manipulatives. We discussed supports that they might provide to teachers who they see that are struggling. Um, we spend the whole day on a Saturday going through every grade level K through eight. For the teachers on the MLC Saturdays, we are talking about what it looks like to plan a unit, all of the things we want them to think about from the language that is being used in the unit, what data you are accessing to let you know what the kids know and already are able to do versus what you need to teach from that unit. Um, we talk about the different strategies that will be used and the different representations that they want to have on hand to support students. So we are doing both. And for the teachers specifically, we are trying to each month target the grade levels based on the content we know that is super important over the next 30 days. So each month we have a teacher session and a principal and an administrator session. For the, the 30 days, they go into classrooms. When we report back, so Saturday was our second one, um, there were some things that administrators were able to share that they had done differently in the building, things that they are working on in terms of internal professional development, and it's partially based on the conversations that we're having and the collaboration that is occurring amongst administrators from a variety of buildings. So that's what the PLC meetings look like. Thank you. Um, we've also been really cognizant to make sure that every school has RTI set aside in the schedule for mathematics. They're not necessarily a walk to the way we're able to do for reading, um, but definitely we're ensuring that that time is prioritized in the schedule at every grade level so that students not only get their core instruction, but get the intervention that they need. Jadon's team is rolling out curriculum audits at the next principals meet, uh, two principal meetings from now. Um, so as we've done in the past, we analyzed the state assessment data from the previous year. We applied it to where we see those skills in our curriculum. We looked at particular items that students struggle with, and we bring that to the administrative team who then can turn key it with their teaching staff. Um, and that gives us good feedback about where, where our curriculum might need to be tweaked. 
Um, so this year, it's the first time with the new curriculum, so a lot of this will be a um, growth opportunity for us as we move forward. We might need to adjust pacing based on what we're seeing, et cetera. Um, obviously, in extended learning time, we're trying to target students. I know there's been a lot of focus on pulling kids in for reading and mathematics, especially at third and sixth whenever possible. Um, our district data meetings with the superintendent help us hone in on where we need to be um, working with schools, where we need to provide supports, um, really looking at the particular data for the interims. Jadon and Jaren Hoard have um, run a wonderful math league for the past several years. So there's one specific to grade six. The students work on challenge problems. So it's, it's one of our ways to accelerate um, mathematics instruction and to help kids really um, get excited about math. There's the banquet at the end of the year, and um, if you've ever attended one, you realize how excited the kids are to come and show off and compete and eat, eat in this beautiful restaurant and get trophies. Um, Jadon and Jaren have also put out welcome back blasts for teachers, which um, as well as parents which include little video snippets and things like that, tips for parents, et cetera, that they can access as they're working with their children at home. And then there's, we're also in the process of an equity-focused math coaching study um, with staff development. So I don't know, I think a couple people might have had some questions at this point. Board member Shuda, go yeah, ahead. Thank you, uh, Chairman Scott. Uh, the thing that I that, uh, uh, that I really um, am wondering about is uh, the coordination of these fundamental skills in the after school program. I, I see it's um, when we talk about the Alex program, is that able is, do they the students have the ability to work on their program? in the after school, the extended learning, or at home, or is it, is it only during the, um, during, I, I'm not sure what that looks like. Is it during the school day only, or is there some coordination with extended learning and at home? So they can use that, pro Jadon, correct me if I'm wrong, but anywhere where they have internet access, so they could use it at home, they can use it at school, um, they can use it at extended learning time. Is there a concentrated effort in the extended learning uh, program curriculum or what we're doing uh, that addresses these um, foundational deficits of math or is it not? So depending on who is working and at what particular grade level, um, when it's our staff members, which it, which it is at the vast majority of the buildings, um, they know the curriculum and they can work with the students. They have access to Alex, to First in Math, to Moby Max, to all those platforms that we use during the instructional day. And we have emphasized with the buildings that, yes, we want um, enrichment in terms of social emotional wellness, but they really have to have a focus on academics. Okay, but there's no, like, uh structured mechanism for that. It's really just based on how the teacher uh, wants to address it in the after school program. Well, they would work with their administration at the building level to determine how they're addressing the skills. We've provided a lot of different suggestions for them, but it's a little, depending on which students are there, they might have different needs, they right. might be at different grade right. levels. Okay, thank you, thank you. You're um, President Belton Cotman, I see your hand is raised. Go ahead. So my question, um, really, um, I'm I'm wondering how um, is this similar this uh similar to Lexis, the model that you had, and are we still using Lexis? Lex, yes, it is similar to Lexia. Um, they both will do a diagnostic and suggest activities for the student to work on to bolster their skills. Are we still using it, Lexus? We do still use Lexium. Lexium is it is called, and that's in our high school level, right? Uh, K eight right now. It's just in K eight. Yes. Uh, Lexium is just K eight. Yes, it's core five up to fifth grade, and then six, seven, and eight. It's called Power Up. 
Okay, are we doing anything in high school? I'm just curious. And similar so, model. Uh, not with that particular program. We have IXL at the high school level, which does the same thing. Okay, cool. Okay, thank you. You're thank welcome. Thank you for your presentation. It's been very informative. Uh, board member McCosey, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Thank you, Chairman Scott. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So my question is around, again, the professional development. I, I'm, you know, I, I love the fact that you're having these meetings and you're making sure that teachers are being met with as well as the administrators. Throughout that 30-day process, once you have these meetings, is it up to the administrator to make sure that the teachers are, um, they're, you know, they're comfortable with this, they're well-informed, or do you follow up uh, throughout that month, just checking in on teachers to see if they need more professional development. I know it would be on the administrator and teacher to, you know, kind of talk with each other around that. But in the instance that, you know, a principal's running the building. So in an instance that gets lost in the shuffle, do you all um, make a pathway for, or at least make sure the door is open or is the PD like structured weekly for people who need, maybe they're not comfortable or maybe they just feel like they need to touch up on the information. These are, you know, we're trying to set goals around this. So I just wanted to make sure that the report backs aren't just on that monthly basis and whether or not there's checkpoints in between that monthly basis with you all and, and the teachers or the principals. So I can address it from my end and Jadon might want to add to what I say. Um, so we have the baseline professional development that we're getting all teachers to attend. Um, even those who don't necessarily teach math as the core, they may support RTI. So we want to make sure that they are fluent in um, Reveal and Alex as well. So we're, that has been a main target for us. It's a two-part training. The first is basic implementation and the second is more focused on using the data from Alex to inform instruction in the classroom and to read the reports and understand them. That's why we made sure principals had that knowledge as well as teachers. Um, so there, that's sort of our baseline. We are still training teachers on numbers, right, which is sort of the theory of math. This is why you provide this support to kids. This is why you teach the way you teach. So that's two prongs. So numbers is more of the theory and the reveal Alex training is more of the implementation, the practical aspect of things. So apply the knowledge you gained during numbers that's, that helps you understand your, your curriculum itself. And then here's how you implement your curriculum. And then we have TOSAs who can go out and support classrooms. So they can either come from a request at the building end or they can be sent by us. So for example, if we went, we walked a school and we saw a need for some support in grade um, six with fractions, maybe there's some kids who just didn't master fractions, but now they're in grade six and they're supposed to be able to do that. We can send a TOSA out. Jadon and Jaren often can go out to support um, and then many buildings have an instructional coach who can provide embedded training at the school level. Um, so it depends on the particular building and the needs that they're identifying. But we, we're trying to make sure that the principals have the, the fundamentals so that they know how to like identify when there's an issue and then give them the tools to, to support. Jadon, I don't know if there's anything you want to add. No, I think you've covered everything. Um, there are also supports in the new resource by way of there is a quote unquote pretest prior to every unit. So the teachers give this pretest to see what the kids know about the unit. So it gives them time to either front load or address misconceptions before they even start. And then throughout each unit, there are these things called probes which are quick, short two question probes that say, okay, at this point in our unit, are there any misconceptions? So there are, we're providing as much professional development as we can for teachers, knowing that unless it's job embedded, it's voluntary. So we have the Saturdays, but we also have follow-ups that are after school. So as much professional development as we can for teachers on the content and the product that they're using. So just today we had um, a principal ask, was there anybody that could model a lesson? So she's going to reach out to one of the TOSAs 
who is going to go into a classroom and model a lesson for a teacher that is struggling to fit everything in in the 60 minutes. So we have a lot of different ways to support, but as Ann said, meeting with the administrators once a month gives them a picture of what to look for so that when they see something that seems out of place, they'll pick up the phone and call immediately or shoot an email saying, here's what I'm noticing, how can we address this? Before, yeah, yes. it was just waiting for them to call or right. reach out. Now, because we're meeting on a monthly basis, sometimes they come in, soon as we start talking about the topics, they notice what's there and they want to ask questions about what can I do right now so that we don't have what I foresee is going to happen. Right. Well, and uh, you answered the question with the fact that, you know, they're coming to and then you send TOSIS out. So there's multiple touches throughout the month if need be. I just wanted to make sure that that was in place because, you know, they can probe the students and they can do these these quizzes. But if they're not 100 percent comfortable with the material, then that's a disconnect. So that that's all I was asking. But thank you very much. You're welcome. You know, I would just like to add, we identified sixth grade as a pivotal year in the past. So we did a lot of training with Gates. So a lot of the current sixth grade teachers actually went through the, the implementation training with Gates when we were using the modules. So they got also a lot of background understanding of the concepts and how ways to roll that out with students that might help address misconceptions. So the, some of the teachers, if they're still in sixth grade, they actually had quite a bit of training um, on theory prior to um, this year. All right, board member McEachin, I see your hand up. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, mine is um, more of a comment, um, so an observation. So, um, Anne, I wanted to just first shout out and recognize that there were only 15 slides. That was not lost on me. I totally want to call that out, but I just want to say, um, as we're you know maneuvering through this, and I, I want to bring this to light just because it's something we've we've talked about, um, and as we're transitioning through SOFG and we're creating these goals and these interims, and we're starting to do the monitoring and the progress reporting, and um, our presentations are shifting. Right, that's just something of note um, that I wanted to say kudos um, on that. Um, and, you know, my, I guess my next ask as we continue to move forward or my next challenge is just that as board members, I know for me, um, and I can only speak for myself in this space, if I can get access to this information a little bit earlier, just to kind of look it over and start to formulate, you know, thoughts. And as a board, we're challenged, you know, obviously to understand the information and be prepared with questions. And it is a little bit difficult to do so when, um, you know, I don't get to see it soon enough, if that makes sense. Um, so that's just my only um, thought, but um, I wanted to acknowledge that I noticed that. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> and, and with that said, we have five minutes remaining in this work session. Um, other board members that don't have their hands up, I see President Belton Common, you have your hand up, but any mm -hmm. others that have not had an opportunity to mm -hmm. ask a question, um, do you have anything you want to ask uh, board member Woods, Vice President Evans Brown, anything? And I think I heard Dr. Rivera's voice, maybe she's at City Hall. I am at City Hall. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Evans Brown, though, I see you unmuted. Oh. You want to, do we have anything? No, I just feel that the presentation was very uh, well thought out. Um, I learned some things, um, especially, you know, where we are in terms of our new cohort of, of sixth grade students. And I really feel like a proud mama because um, Dijon Wax, she hates me saying this, but she was my student when she was in high school. So cool <laughs> to you, lady. All right. Um, Dr. Ann Rivera, board member Rivera, anything? from City Hall? Uh, the only comment I'd like to make is I'm really, I'm really happy to see that they're doing professional learning communities. Oh, it's a 100% credit to the math department on this one. It's, it's a major achievement with the amount of teachers and principals that are working with, but you know, I think they really are beneficial. So thank you for doing that extra work to close that loop for folks. 
Thank you, Board Member Rivera. Uh, President Belton Cotman, you have another question? Yes, I do. Um, the math geeks, where are we with them this year? Were we able to provide any um, money to improve that program? Is, uh, is it purely still volunteer or teachers or whatever? Where are we with our math geeks this year? Our math leads? Geeks. <laughs> they said they were geeks when I was in there. They called themselves math geeks. So we, we were um, in our budget provided with some funding so that the coaches can stay after school with their teens. Um, with after school only being a few days a week, at least once a week, they should be able to dedicate that day to working with their team. We've also expanded this year to go down to first and second grade. Wow. So are so, you going to have more participants than last year? Um. I don't have a count today, but we have been, the rosters from the buildings have been coming in. So this year we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, eight running from now until probably around March. So we are in the process now of sending out meet one to everyone and looking for somewhere to hold all of these banquets for all of our kids because Amen. we are outgrowing all of the spaces that we have been using from year to year. Okay, nice and we had also, I'm sorry, Ann, what was that? I just said it's a nice problem to have. Yeah, it is. And we also talked about bringing the young people down to City Hall and letting them be a part of our um, champions, letting them be a part of a board meeting so that they could, that the board could meet them and they can be on TV. We talked about bringing um, the top performers. So, you know, I don't want that to be lost either. And we had talked about possibly doing it for September, but it uh, slid by. But I think it's important that we um, elevate those young people that go that extra mile and uh, do that. And it's a beautiful program that you have. And I just wanted to make sure that it was still moving forward. So thank you for the work that you both are doing. I'm a math person, I love math. Um, and um, I need to brush up some because uh, them two questions, one of them I got right, but the other one I didn't do too well on. And you know how I participate, Ann and the John. You know when I don't get the answer right, nobody's learning in the room. <laughs> that's, that's a joke between us. All right, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, so thank you, Chief Bonicelli, Director Wagstaff, for the presentation. I don't have any questions. Um, I appreciate the examples that you provided um, for us to all see how complex math is at a sixth grade level. I don't recall uh, having to know and understand uh, what you showed us in those examples when I was in sixth grade, but maybe I'm just forgetting my sixth grade. Um, Chief Botticelli, Director Wagstaff, Dr. Caressis, anything, any closing comments before we transition to our next work session? Uh, no, I just want to echo thanks to Ann and Jadon for a great presentation and thank you board members for participating as well as you did. All right, this concludes our work session for student achievement. And I believe I'm turning it over to Vice President Evans Brown for Executive Affairs. Yes, thank you, Chair Scott, and congratulations again on your win. Uh, thank for you. For continuation of uh, at large seats. So, welcome to the Executive Affairs. Um, today, we will continue our journey um, through our SOFG, Student Outcome Focused Gover Governance. Um, sponsored by the Council of Gray City Schools. We know that student outcomes don't change until adult behaviors change. Uh, members of our board, the Honorable uh, Jim McCosey, uh, the Honorable Paulette Woods, and myself completed a year long SOFG cohort. So we graduated, um, specifically designed um, you know, to help the district move forward and increase student outcomes. 
Uh, Honorable Cindy McCatchum also completed the year-long advanced governance cohort, and we welcome her back after the loss of her mom. Welcome back, Cindy. Um, and, and lastly, President Delton Cotman has completed this SOG cohort prior to, to us partaking in it. So I really encourage new board members to participate next year. Um, Leslie can give you the dates for that. Um, so today, uh, with that said, Leslie Grant, our um, coach from um, the Council of Great City Schools and board member Cindy McCouchin will co-present um, the next layers of this journey. So well, um, before I do that, um, Dr. Will Preston, do you have anything to say be, um, before they get started? No, thank you, Madam Vice President. I'll just turn it over to board member McKechn and to Leslie Grant. Awesome, well, thank you. Um, Leslie, do you have the presentation that you can pull up or in mirror, are you pulling the presentation up? I don't know how I can that's do it. Yeah, I can run it. If I can share screen, I'll run it off this. Hang on one second. And while she's doing that, I want to add that um, our interim goals was presented um, timely by the superintendent to the board on the 23rd of October. So you all had an opportunity to please lean over those. So this is what Leslie spoke to today. Yeah, can y'all see that? I'm sharing, yes. Yes, yeah. I see Jen, okay, yeah. In the City Hall, and I don't know if you can see that as well. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Um, Cindy, any tea up for this? Um, so tonight we're gonna cover two things. Um, as Dr. Kathy Evans Brown just stated, um, we have been going through the process of um, developing our 25 through 30 goals and guardrails. And as we move through phases of the process, um, the superintendent provides us with interims um, for both of those categories. Um, and we're gonna just highlight those today and then talk about what the next steps are. Um, maybe remind some folks about what we've done to get us to that point. And then we're also gonna um, go through our board self-evaluation. However, we are doing it a little bit differently than I think we've done it in previous months um, as we kind of test out that process. Um, Leslie, is that, am I good? Yeah, <laughs> okay. I think so. Um, we'll just dive in here. Um, I actually was gonna get you all to go through the board self-evaluation first. Um, that is something that you all um, were given a link to if you wanted to look at that. So I hope you all have looked at that in terms of what we, um, you know, like what we're accomplishing. But what I really wanna do is get to um, this. This is very important that the board um, considers the proposals made by the superintendent and her staff for the interim goals and interim guardrails. Um, it is important that you understand um, sort of in, in this process before you can officially adopt your draft goals and guardrails, you have a clear draft right now um, and the annual targets for those that you do um, understand how the superintendent plans to report back to you on that. So again, those would be your interim goals and interim guardrails. And we did have a sample of it today. Um, thank you, Dr. Botticelli and your team for that. Um, so what, uh, what we're gonna do with this whole, uh, the 25 through 30, the big five-year goals um, will be to have a very, um, uh, very uh, clean, clear monitoring calendar. The board will understand when each of these is coming up um, for, um, for review. You will have plenty of time in advance to look at those um, reports, the monitoring reports that you're gonna get and ask um, questions in advance in writing um, that have to do with the technical or tactical um, uh, questions that you may have. And those would be shared with everyone. And then we could um, spend the sessions talking about the strategies that are used. So that is a really quick preview of what you should look forward to next year in your monitoring sessions. Um, so right now today, I just again wanted to go through this. This is something that has been shared with the full board in advance. Um, 
So the, um, the board is not adopting the interims, but the board does need to see this and be, you know, like a thumbs up with, yes, this is, um, we feel that this satisfies the goal that we want to monitor. Leslie, um, can I just jump in for a second? Um, I do want to just um, highlight that, you know, this is, we did this in a very fast paced experience last year. This year we are going through the process um, and, and I guess flowing through it in the, um, the, the way that it should taking the time. And I just want to stress that, um, you know, it's been a change in behavior for all of us because we recognize that student outcomes don't change till adult behaviors change. And um, each one of us are being asked to shift and move um, in a different way. And um, I want to not lose sight of, again, a comment Kathy made, but we challenged the district right after we as a board came together and developed the goals and guardrails. Um, we handed that over and, and asked the superintendent to come back with interims and her and her team did deliver those interims um, by the date that we asked. And the next steps from there uh, was for the board to review what was sent to us and kick out any potential questions or comments or considerations so that we can um, have fruitful discussion um, and continue to move this process forward um, so that we can go into those next steps. And I just wanted to highlight that, that we're now in this space. Yeah. Yes, so what um, would be very helpful tonight is again, the board has had this, um, you have your draft goals, your draft guardrails. Um, that would be the um, part at the top here. Goal one had to do with college and career readiness. Um, the three interims that were proposed, um, first one had to do with completing uh, past or completing advanced placement, dual credit, international baccalaureate. Um, in all of these, y'all were present for the draft. I'm pretty certain everyone was there. Um, but. Um, Anyway, I just want to, I, I don't think we need to spend a ton of time because we will run out tonight um, uh, going over these, you know, inch by inch. Is there anything on here that you have reviewed that, um, you know, you need to bring up or question right now? Or do you feel that the three pieces they're going to monitor for this would give you an assurance about the overall goal? I can also and just challenge or state that there are a couple blanks in here and um the team did bring to us that um they're going they were going to give us the language so we understood what they're looking to measure they're still gathering the data to yeah. plug into that space but at least we as a board are informed at what they're looking to measure um, which is very helpful. So that was a consensus and that was conversation with the data team um, and the superintendent as we you know moved through this process yeah and one more thing is the um interim goals so the overall goal is a five-year 24 25 through 29 30. the interim goals would be shorter than that so i know we have a sort of target ending here our guidance was um to make the interim goals maybe either one to three year so that they do have an opportunity to really assess like is this where we want to stay they can keep it for the full five years but just um, to make it a shorter period of time for the interim so they can do that. So, okay. Can, can I say, ask a question or make a point here? Um, mm -hmm. Something came up this past last week when I was at East High School. And I'm, I, I, I reread this for this meeting. Initially, it did not come up to my, in mind, but now it has. And the issue of equity came up. Um, um, the children were saying that they would like the opportunity to participate in AP courses. And um, I'm, I did a little research and I'm wondering if, if did we need to um, sort of ask that some sort of an equity overlay or something be put in here because what I found out is that certain schools are working together with online courses, but certain children, are, East for example, was not allowed the opportunity to participate in that program and so and there's a the children want to take it so I'm, i don't know if this is the place to bring this up but i do did want to share that with the board that that was an issue that came up when the students were expressing themselves that they would have liked to have more ap courses in their building and when i started asking a question i found out 
that Olmstead is sharing classes with other schools or city honors and other schools are do, sharing courses. And I'm wondering if there's not a need at this point after that conversation to see if there there can be some sort of um, equity overlay or something put in place. I don't know if I'm out of line or what, but I, I felt I should share that with the board that, um, you know, AP courses, um, they would like to take more AP courses and they, and they don't have a large population of children who will do it. So they would need to um, do something online virtually uh, with a, another group. So I don't know if that's something, but that that's a, that's a concern for me. And so I just wanted to share it with the board and I don't know what we can do about it. Thank you. Sharon, I think that um, in the guardrail that, Leslie, I think you'll show that that's part of the prerequisite to answer that question about, you know, equity at that school and any school in our district, that the allocation of resources are available for all schools, including AP. I thought I saw it in the guardrail. Yeah, but we we've been thinking that they were available all the time, and we didn't and we didn't know that they they're not. They're only selected courses. It's not that they don't have the courses. It's just that they like to take the physics. They like to take um, the um, the uh, you know higher uh, or the more difficult courses. Uh, but I don't know. We, we could you know I, I think maybe you know we can talk about that at some other time if necessary. But there is a need to make sure that all children. Who want to take this um who have the opportunity get it and that's what i'm being told Agreed. is not so um i do think that in the interim goals here the percentage of enrolled cohort students who have ap dual credit or international baccalaureate course um, are on track in coursework that will result in technical endorsement um i mean the that could address it somehow. I think if you are looking to solve every issue that you hear in the community um, with these goals and guardrails, it's not, you're not going to hit it. Um, it is something that um, you are looking at sort of the biggest list that you can get for the district um, and certainly a strategy to um, have this one is, um, you know, you're wanting to concentrate on economically disadvantaged um, mm -hmm. public high school students who graduate within four years, demonstrating proficiency by passing AP dual credit international baccalaureate. So one of the strategies this superintendent and her team may employ may have to do with access. But again, that is a strategy that they will develop. Um, and I think if the, you know, I, I would not advise the board to be putting um, mandates on the strategies for the superintendent at this point. I'm not Absolutely talking lifting about it up. Absolutely lifting it up is completely lifting appropriate. Lifting it up is yeah. if we have an equity, equity we have, we're supposed to have equity throughout the district. And if there's an opportunity for children to take online courses, then I just want, so, you know, we can talk more about that, but okay. that was a big issue for those uh, young people in that building. Um, and so uh, of the, um, just to keep us on track here, of the three interims proposed for this, um, are there any um, anything anybody wants to lift up around this? And again, our guidance is, this is, you asked the superintendent or her team to respond to how we're gonna get to this goal. They came back to you with three pieces of data that they're gonna track, um, you know, in the next year to three, um, that they believe will give you an indication. Do you feel that those three are capable of giving you an indication that they will be um, able to reach that goal. That's what we're asking for you not um, to, and, and honestly, if you're not comfortable as a team, if you don't come to consensus on this, our guidance would be that you rewrite your goal. And I just, um, I'm not clear, because I, I wasn't copied on if anybody did, was there any correspondence, any feedback on this um, that was, given in writing? Uh, not that I know of. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So consensus to move forward with goal one as it is. Keep that as your draft. Satisfied with the interims. All right. Goal two had to do with literacy. And for this one, you're measuring the percentage of economically disadvantaged third grade students 
um, proficient in ELA. Um, the way that they're planning to measure this one um, have to do with proficiency in ELA on the iReady assessment, um, proficient on Dibbles, and um, again, tracking what um, was just reported in um, the previous session around making sure, trying to bring students who are well below average up. So that would be a gap closure piece there. So, or growth, sorry. Um, so, sorry, some missing around there. Any um, questions here? Moving on, um, goal three was numeracy. Um, grade four, demonstrating proficiency on the math assessment. Um, this one tracks very closely with the, um, the literacy one as well. Um, they're using iReady, which is that um, formative assessment um, to, um, to understand where the students are during th or throughout the year. Um, any feedback on this? And again, our guidance, our guidance would be that we not have these five year long interim. So this, that may change with this, but otherwise the, um, um, not the metrics that they're gonna use, the measurements. Uh, I have a, I have a statement. So this, this applies to what uh, we talked about earlier um, about how do we make sure that this group of children get on track if we're talking but then I, I understand it that this is a new group of children, I, I would think. No, it's not. This is measuring the same group of children. Okay, because these, these start at 16, 19 or whatever. My concern is how do we, and and and, and, and um, Jadon shared it, that how they're gonna work. But I, I, I guess from my perspective, I thought the goals were a little low uh, for a five year old down the way. That's what I felt. And I, Are you and talking I, about the annual target? Right, the annual target. Okay. Well, I do want to discuss that separately in just a minute, okay? Okay, good. So, but um, what I'm, yeah, what I was going to, what I was trying to get across was for the interims, don't look at the, um, at the targets here. Those would be theirs to set. Um, and again, I don't, uh, you know, we're hoping that, that those become one to three years instead of five years for the interims. So um, goal three, numeracy, and then again, your goal four, numeracy as well. That was, they were um, tracking two grades, which they felt were important for the numeracy piece, fourth grade, and then fifth grade. So, um, okay. Mm -hmm. Hearts and minds. All right, and now the guardrails, equitable allocation, um, your goal or your guardrail value statement here is that the superintendent shall not allow buildings to be without necessary resources based on academic, social, and social emotional needs of students to attain the academic achievement goals, utilizing modifications to the budget system. Um, the guardrails they're recommending um, uh, are here. One has to do with um, trying to decrease the amount of long-term suspension. Second has to do with um, uh, making sure that reading teachers are provided to the schools, Title I elementary schools, um, to deal with the economically disadvantaged students, um, as well as the ones uh, to track the dibbles. Essentially, guardrail one, two, and one, three are your interim uh, for the reading goal. But bottom line, y'all are wanting to make sure that the re equitable allocation of resources to meet the goals that you set. So this is how this one is cross um, cross posted, I guess. Any questions on this one? And then the uh, last one, your um, second guardrail had to do with culture and climate. Um, superintendent shall not allow the standards listed in the district's code conduct, character, and support document um, to be unenforced, including out-of-school suspensions, safety strategies, and school culture and climate expectations. Um, the way that they are um, letting you know they will track this has to do with um, a communication campaign um, established to support students who are excluded from school attendance due to um, immunization. So that would um, track um, uh, students who are, I, I assume, not there for um, the immunizations. 
disproportionality regarding suspensions. Um, so decreasing the um, long-term suspension of African-American male students. Uh, last one is relative risk ratio for special ed students. So um, reducing the um, long-term suspension as well for that. So. And so from this, um, again, you've all had an opportunity to look at this. I want to bring up um, to uh, uh, President Cotman's point, the annual targets. So what the board is charged with setting are these targets on the, um, the annual growth targets. What the district would set would be the targets for the interims. Um, so um, if you, this was a sort of a breakdown of um, analysis of what the proposal is for the college and career readiness one. We don't have that yet because we do need to set a baseline for that. So that would be something the board needs to set next year. Um, the um, literacy one, we're working at it right now at a 19.3% um, is your baseline for the grade three economically disadvantaged. The goal would be to move that to um, 31. 31.5%. Uh, so that's a 12% gain over that period of time. Um, the next one would be numeracy going from 16% to 35%. That is a 19% gain over the five years, um, a little more than double. And then numeracy is going for the, sorry, for the fifth grade numeracy going from 15.5% all the way to 27%, which would give you 11.5% um, for the five-year period. So um, if you have any questions about that, again, I'm uh, making assumptions that everybody has read this and had the opportunity to ask those questions um, in advance of tonight. Um, but certainly if there's something you need to bring forward, please do so. Did I hear you say, Leslie, that um, reducing this to a three-year period? This is These are your goals. These are the overall goals. The recommendation was that maybe the interims be reduced to one to three years so they can get a look okay. on those and, yeah. Okay. Have All the right. opportunity to um, change that up if they don't feel like those are working, you know, it's not as big of a commitment. So. Well. I'm going to go on record to say that I feel overall for a five-year period, they're pretty low. And um, that's what I, I didn't push back. I read it, I looked at it, and I said, um, is the goal to make sure we achieve the goals or is the goal to make sure that we get children where they need to be in five years? At this particular pace, my concern is, is that it will take us five, ten, ten additional years to get children where they should be at the um, uh, 50 to 75 percent ratio of being uh, where they should be. So, you know, if this is the best that the district can do, then it's the best they can do. But um, I sort of had um, sort of like higher expectations myself. That's what I'm going on record to say. That's all. Yeah, I think it's a projection and each year we will be, well, yeah, each year we'll be monitoring it, correct? Um, and, and modifying those numbers, I would assume. Um, so, I mean, what you're trying to do is you're trying to set um, very firm targets, annual targets for the district um, for each of these years. So your annual target for this year is, and this was the recommendation was, based on what we see, what, you know, typical projective growth is right now, what, um, you know, look, looking back, what the performance has been and then projecting forward. So if you take this literacy one, for instance, you have um, the projection is that there will be a 1.7% over the next year, then two, 2.5, 5.5, then six the last year. So really um, the goal would be that we're, you know, we're not out of the box kicking it because there has to be reorganization within the, um, within the enterprise. You have to change things. You have to assess, you know, like what you're, what do you have? What do you need? What are you getting rid of in order to make space for that? So there's a lot of organizational pieces that need to happen. That cascading we talked about in the cohort, that needs to happen. That takes time. So again, 
the hope is that once you get to these later years, you really start kicking up in terms of what you can do year over year. The first few years, you're not going to, you know, again, you're not coming out of the box kicking because you have not, you know, like, again, there's, there's work to do in terms of changing an organization this way. And so that, I think the annual targets do reflect that. Now, you know, if y'all have, you know, that is a conversation you need to have with your, um, with the administration in terms of, um, you know, if you're not plussed about what these are, if you don't believe these are stretch goals for the five years or whatnot, that is a question you have. Um, are these low? Absolutely. Um, are they a lot better than, you know, where you're starting? Absolutely. And I think it's a, um, you know, that is a piece that y'all need to have a conversation about. But um, just note, we have had, you know, there have been other boards who, you know, believe that they need to get, if they don't set a goal of 100% literacy for every student in the district, then they're failing at their job. And that is a completely unrealistic expectation that I think demoralizes the um, administration. So the balance has to be, we want to, we need to stretch. These need to be stretch goals. They, this is where the stretch comes in. Um, they need to cause adult behavior change. If there is no adult behavior change, the system creates the same conditions it has currently. That means you're not going to make changes for students. In order to create adult behavior change, there needs to be, you know, like a, something that is requiring that, which again would mean a higher expectation. So. Any other comments? Um, all right, so just to um, review, next steps would be um, the responsibility that you have that you've exhibited so far in terms of trying to bring your community in on this. These are not the board's goals. These are not the superintendent's goals. These should be the community goals, right? You went out and did a obnoxious amount of listening for all of your schedules, I know, but um, like really try to, you know, engage with the community, ask them specifically what they want for the future of students in BPS, listen to that, put that together with data from the district, like what was the current reality, and you all came up with the drafts that we have now. Um, so what the recommendation is that you go back to the community and say, okay, this is what we heard, this is what we've come up with, so that the community has that touch point before you adopt them. And this is about building transparency and trust with your community. So um, we have talked at our um, last meeting, um, the um, last meeting uh, of the implementation committee about what your, um, a couple of routes to get that community share happening before um, we get through with the holidays. So I think we have a plan for that, a schedule for that, and a way to make that happen. Um, the, um, Next step after that, after you get the, you know, like have that um, interaction with the community would be um, provided there are no big changes that come up or anything, that the board adopts those goals and guardrails. And it's only once you do a formal adoption saying, yes, these are the commitments that we are making to our students for the next five years. This is what we want to have happen. These are the values we need protected. Once you make that formal adoption, that the board is committed to that so that the administration can be committed to that. So once we begin that, that's where I call the real work of this begins, right? I know you've put in a lot of work to date. The real work of this begins once you give the mandate to the district about what you want to have happen for students and they're allowed the time and space to get that um, in the mix. And then they're gonna become, they're gonna come back to you and be doing this regular progress monitoring letting you know where things are at with the students in the district because of the changes you've asked them to make. Um, so what we we could, I mean, there are a couple of dates here. We could get to a Golden Guard Rail adoption in December. Um, we should get to it in, Feb in January, excuse me, at the latest, if, if you want to stay on this schedule. The 24, I mean, the 25, 26, the first year of these was set in um, anticipation and respect for the administration's need 
to start budgeting towards these. If you don't have this and y'all are not committed to this by, you know, your January meeting, I would say the administration is going to have insufficient time to start building their budgets for the next year to reflect this. So that's why we have a, you know, a time crunch. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's a crunch. I think you have plenty of time in here to do this. You just have to make sure that it moves forward. Um, the, any questions about that, about the next few steps with the goals, guardrails, interim goals, interim guardrails? I don't have a question, Leslie. I just want to call out, um, Dr. K, I need you to return my email so we can start talking about setting up those sessions um, that Leslie talked about in terms of the community share. Right. I think we can maybe button that up right now, which is uh, I had a conversation with Dr. Reynolds today. We're going to assign a staff person tomorrow um, who will coordinate the meetings. I think you were looking at having them occur over two consecutive Saturdays in December. Yes. And so we will have, um, if you want to let me know what's the best time for someone to reach out to you, I'm just going to want that person to hear directly from you, you know, about how you want those meetings to go, what the logistics are. Okay. Um, and we'll have, we'll have that person reach out to you and go ahead and schedule those meetings. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. And then if you, uh, Cindy, or if there's someone else on the implementation committee who can then, um, you know, communicate with the board, here's where the meetings are, here's what the expectations are for your participation, the logistics for the board members, if you could, you know, share that with them, then we'll all be on the same page. Yes, and it is in the implementation minutes, um, our rough idea of what we're thinking. Um, it's not deep dive detailed and there's more information we'll be able to um, send out as well. So, yes. And again, as always, the implementation committee meeting minutes, uh, we might have missed one, I think, but um, are on the implementation website that I built for you all. Um, if you just scroll down a little bit, you can find that those minutes there. So I uh, recommend you read through those consistently if you can. Um, okay, so that would be uh, that would be us getting through uh, approval of the goals and guardrails um, in December at the earliest. Um, and if uh, not December, then um, by January for sure. Um, hey, excuse me one second. You know, Cindy and I'll be, if you'd like to touch base with me, uh as we're planning that i'll be glad to assist you yep absolutely um so another thing that we were talking about um during the uh during the implementation committee meeting um and i do want to get to the board self-evaluation but i want to bring this up first so um for the superintendent's evaluation for 24 25 um, I know that y'all have done uh, a, uh, you've done a good job, you've um, put in the work to um, set goals for this year. Again, we weren't to the point where you're ready to set the long-term five-year goals yet. Y'all have set some for this year. They are responding. You got a report on that tonight. Um, I would love it if we can get a calendar for this year, um, a monitoring calendar that sets up when y'all will get those reports so you can have that in your mind. Um, we can start that. That's a that would be a you know a best practice, um, and we have a meeting set up about um, that with the staff in a couple of weeks or next week maybe. But um, so one of the things that you all need to decide on respectfully for the superintendent is what are going to be the metrics for the superintendent's uh, 24 25 evaluation. Um, Kathy, we talked about this at, um, that perhaps you would bring this up in the educational support meeting next week. Um, uh, decide with a few of your colleagues, like on a, you know, a mini process to figure out what exactly you're going to put into her evaluation for that year. Um, it really is uh, very important. If you want to make this work, the work of the district, if you want to make sure that the, you know, first and second and third and fourth priority are the goals that the board has set, that would should, wouldn't should be the expectations for the superintendent. That should be, you know, what you are evaluating her on. I know there are other things. Y'all need to talk about that, but you do need to get that set before um, moving too much uh, forward with this. 
So there's time to do that still within this calendar year. Um, and Kathy can, you can talk a little bit more about that later. Um, yeah, I, I do want to stay there though for a minute. Um, <clears throat> I do want um, folks on the board, at least two people to volunteer um, to be on an ad hoc so that we can uh, take the superintendent's evaluation for the 24-25 year and hone in on that. So if, uh, two people, thank you. Yep, and just can y'all do that offline? If if I can, just so we're not taking time. Oh, to absolutely, do that. Just, I, just, yeah. I just want to okay. put it out there. Yeah, thank okay. You. All right. Yes. So, um, and y'all can, you can talk more about what your, you know, like what the time frame would be on that. Um, board guardrails for the board. Uh, I think one of the first things we did uh, was to adopt a set of um, board guardrails for the board. Those as well are on the BPS implementation site. Um, I would encourage you to uh, look at those again, but what you're, you know, they don't matter. They're just some paper that's out there if you can find it unless and until you set up some sort of accountability system for how you're going to hold yourselves accountable to those guardrails. How are you going to measure the board's fidelity to the things that you said you wanted to um, hold each other? So that's a question um, we need to, you know, bring up and dig into. Um, and it will come up a little bit on the um, in the next steps here and the self-evaluation. Um, the last piece here on the next steps before we go back to the evaluation is a 2025 work session. Um, I think it's going to be very important. You will have uh, two, congratulations, uh, board member Scott. Um, I think you will have two new board members though who are not familiar with this work, although I think all of the candidates came to our info session. But um, coming back up and having a, um, a work session with you all mid to late January. Um, so I think Dr. Crestes will, um, maybe be circulating some uh, potential dates for that. So, but that would, again, it's one of those, we have, uh, you know, really need to get a grip on what's coming, um, how this work is gonna roll out. So um, I know I keep saying it's, we'll get lighter at some point, but um, once we get you to progress monitoring, um, it will, it will feel more, um, less hectic, I think. So, um, any questions about that? That um, again, there's going to be plenty more details about all of that. Any anything that you need to know right now? No, I just wanted to put out there again, Dr. K. Since you're sitting there, um, if we could possibly survey the board and just try to get a potential date in January, because um, I know calendars fill up. So I'll. Um, I'd like to give you a call just so we can. I have a conversation around how much time, location. Are we looking for like a mini retreat here on yeah, this? Yeah, it would be like a okay. mini retreat. And um, I think we could just really honestly do it at City Hall. Um, I don't think it needs to be anything special fancy. It's really just an opportunity for us to set the tone going into um, this next year of what's to come, but also just a reminder of like what we've done and, and how we're functioning. So we kind of have that flow. And we can do that. Okay. Often. Yep. Let's let's just firm up the plans, and then I'll get something out to the board uh, by Friday, just to get some good dates, and then we'll go ahead and schedule it. Awesome. All right. Whipping through here. Um, board self evaluation. Um, if the board is not evaluating itself, then it shouldn't be evaluating the superintendent who shouldn't be evaluating the performance of students in the district. Um, if your commitment to this work is that you want to change the adult behaviors, yours, and I've said this many, many times, there are nine people in the city of Buffalo who can change the outcome for children um, if you choose. That choice, that commitment is not something that's simple. It doesn't come easy. It comes with lots of self-reflection. It comes with the board committing to doing all of this work, um, you know, and poke holes in it, ask questions, do whatever you need to do to feel good about it. But at the end of the day, unless you all are rowing in the direction that you say you want to go, it's not going to happen. And the way that we do track this is by, um, you know, quarterly board self-evaluations. Um, we are a little off with that, and I just want it to become something regular. Once you develop your monitoring calendar, 
those will be on there. What we want to get you to is a um, literally a board calendar, an administrative calendar, so you can see, you know, five years out in the distance what's coming, right? But definitely you will understand and know, okay, this month we have this, this, and this we're going to monitor. We're going to do a board self-evaluation so that you get into the habit, these really good high quality habits that signal the culture you want in the district is one of continuous improvement, starting with the board. So um, while we're going through this, and I know that we've done it a couple of times before, but honestly, we haven't sort of gotten, you know, to where we can get off home base, because really a lot of this work has to do with you accomplishing those, you know, like adopting the goals and guardrails before you do a lot of the other pieces. However, there is a lot in here I want to look at real quick. We're going to go through it. Um, the um, I, My quarters are different than your quarters um, because they have to do with the number of quarters that we've been working with you all. Um, what we're going to do is we just want to review really quickly completion of quarter five, which was July through September of last year. Um, and then we're going to go through and look at some things we anticipate can be completed by your next review of October through December of this year. So that evaluation, um, board self-evaluation will not happen until maybe January, February. But I want us to look at what we could do. Um, what our guidance on this would be that after you review these, after you come to consensus, yes, this is where everybody thinks we are. Yeah, we can probably get here. You, at your next board meeting, you adopt that so that it becomes a real document that you've looked at, okay? Um, we have some next steps and um, some things that we were, uh, want to assign and uh, monitor for completion. And these are sort of some to-dos, but um, we'll get to that a little later. But this, um, this one is up on that website as well, the board um, implementation website. So if you wanted to follow along there, you could. I know, I think um, uh, uh, Kathy had asked y'all to bring your, um, your uh, student outcomes focused governance manuals that I know y'all have laminated on your fridges um, with you tonight. And this document completely exactly tracks to the manual if you wanted to follow along that way. But um, so what we're doing here is um, this is the first domain, we call it. If you look in your manual, it's called vision and goals. And what we're trying to measure here is that the board will, in collaboration with the superintendent, adopt goals that are student outcome focused goals. So this is the big cheese here. Um, on this sheet, um, so far, you have not, um, you really haven't gotten off home base again because you haven't adopted the goals and um, yet. Um, there's also, I had, um, I think there's still some uh, inconsistency around, can y'all see this? Are you looking at it? Is it teeny tiny? Do I need to blow it up a little bit? Yeah, please blow it up a little bit. All right, that's a little bit more. Yeah. But um, for these, I really, really highly would recommend that you all have your own copy so that you can look at it and discern the language. And for the public, if they wanna, you know, you're welcome to share that website and they can look at it there. But bottom line is I think there's some inconsistency around demonstration of ability to distinguish between inputs, outputs, and outcomes. What that actually means, like, could you technically give the definition? But I think it's more of an active, like, you know, like uh, in terms of the board understanding, you know, who's who's playing and what lane. And that probably tracks back to one of the board guardrails. So I, I do want us to look at that in the future. Um, this next one, um, the board has adopted goals. You haven't yet, but so this is where the highlight comes in, okay? Everything for this highlight are things I think you can get to in the next quarter. So that you can have this done the next quarter, which we're talking about right now, October, November, December, I think you can get these done, okay? So um, you're on track to do all your goals are smart at this point. Um, no uh, fewer than one, no more than five. Um, so I think you're on track here to, um, sorry, I skipped on you. I think you're on track here to get this um, all cleaned up. Um, there are ones here that you could pick up as well. The board's goals all pertain to desired student outcomes. Yes, they do. Um, in addition to the goal ending points, you've adopted annual targets. So that was the proposal you received. Um, the superintendent provided you interim goal ending points. So all of that I think you can get with where you're at right now. Um, interim goals pertain to student outputs or student outcomes, not inputs or adult outputs. Um, are we in agreement on that one? Leslie, question. So, yes, 
Okay, so are we looking at the five year plan or are we looking at 24 25? Um, I think you absolutely need to look at 20, the five year plan for this one. Okay. So, all right. Thank you. You will not have implemented them, but you will, if you're, what I'm saying is if you get to adopting in December, right, this is a projection. I think you can get to where you're adopting the 25 30 by December. So that is the quarter we're looking at the next quarter is October, November, December. Everybody totally confused. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So the goals all last from three to five years. Interims last from one to three years. So again, that's something we, um, I've got a note here, currently presented as five years. So we want to um, just tweak that a little bit. Um, goals and interim goals will challenge the organization and will, will require change in adult, adult behaviors. So to um, President Cotman's point, like, you know, again, this has to do not with the written goal itself, but it has to do with the targets. So if you choose to focus on those things and those targets, um, you know, is there agreement that the um, this is going to require adult behavior change within the organization? Challenge the organization. So um, I'm not asking you to weigh in on that tonight. I think that is something you all, you know, like just definitely need to consider. Um, the other thing too is over here, like in the master class, and this would be awesome as if you scoot on through this. Um, the um, interim goals are predictive of the respective goals um, and are influenceable by the superintendent. And that was something that we had talked about. If the superintendent can't influence it, you know, at least 80% of the way, it really is not a great interim. I think the things they've come back with are things that are under her influence, the superintendent and her team's influence. Um, and predictive that there's a correlation between what you want and what the interims are. So I think those two questions would be, um, you know, sufficient um, for you all to uh, consider tonight. Um, and those two, this one here in the mastering and this one here. If you did get this, you are moving along to you would move along to 35 points. And I really don't want to keep score with this in terms of numbers, but I do think it's important. You know, again, our students have to pay attention to numbers. The board does as well. But I don't want that to be the motivation for this. But so any questions about this one, about the goal? Vision and goals. All right, for the values and guardrails, um, pretty similar. They track with the goals um, pretty well. Um, I think the uh, by next quarter, again, next meaning the one we're currently in, when you monitor that, uh, when you evaluate yourself there, I think you can get clear with um, uh, adopting the guardrails, um, the smart interims with that, um, and can these be updated multiple times during each year? Did you publicly post them for comment prior to adoption? That's what the community feedback piece is going to be. Um, the superintendent has provided interim guardrail ending points. Yes, again, we want to um, get those down to three to five years as well, or three to one to three years. I'm sorry. Interim goals pertain to adult uh, pertain to outputs, not out. Uh, sorry, outputs or outcomes, not inputs. So they're not, um, you know, specifically measuring, you know, we're going to put 12 more books in a class or something. Um, so the board, this one is going to be, uh, we have not considered this theory of action. Um, this is probably going to prevent us from moving ahead um, with this value one, but it's okay. Um, theory of action would be a bigger conversation around um, uh, the district as a whole and how, you um, how the district as a whole wanted to um, sort of, you know, adopt um, an overall, a big overall guardrail is what this is. And we have not discussed that yet. Um, again, the same column for the mastering, um, we would be uh, here. So any questions or feedback about this? Um, all right, for this one, monitoring and accountability, this one's going to take a little bit longer, but we are looking at a lot of things out and um, we put some notes here in the process owner 
category is really more projections. Um, superintendent led the interim goal and guardrails and monitoring calendar development process work while the collect working collaborative lead with the board. This is the one we hope we can get the monitoring calendar, the whole process going. We have a um, meeting that is getting scheduled about that, but that would be, um, that would be great. If that all goes smoothly, um, we believe you can begin progress monitoring pretty soon. Our hope would be that you um, look at your agenda and do a lot of other things, but that we're really um, trying to get the work shifted so that you're spending more of your board authorized public meeting minutes on your goal monitoring. Um, sorry guys, okay. So you can adopt the monitoring calendar hopefully early first quarter next year, um, calendar year. Um, the span of it, all these things would be intact there. Um, this one here is one we talked a little bit about. Superintendent is evaluated only on performance regarding the board's goals, guardrails, and interim goals and guardrails. The board considers superintendent performance to be indistinguishable from school system performance. You are not there yet. This is a conversation I do encourage you all to have. This is a decision the board needs to make about priorities and what you're valuing. So, um, but this is something that can, will happen um, in the next, you know, few months. Um, this has to do, again, back with the frequency of monitoring. This can, this is all stuff for first quarter next year. We can probably move on. Um, okay. Um, this one, uh, time use evaluations, communication and collaboration is the title here. Um, what we really need to do is start doing time use evaluations. Like what are you spending your time on? So when you're in these meetings, what are we tracking again? the your way you set your values is the way you spend your money and your time are you spending your money and your time money of all the people who are convened for these meetings money of the district that goes into satisfying the curiosities of the board all of these things are they being spent in furtherance of the goals and guardrails you set um, doing these time use evaluations will track that um, We need to talk about um, the board operating procedures um, and the concept of the policy diet work. We talked a little bit about this, um, but really if you all want to sort of move and commit to this work in a real meaningful way, you've got to, you know, like have some very clear, simple, um, agree to board operating procedures and really work um, through the board, uh, the diet, policy diet, sorry. Um, this one, I think is, uh, this is, again, is really critical in the blue down here, the bottom one, um, uh, the, over here in the green as well about the board editing the, um, agenda, making sure that there, you know, the agendas are set, that there's a, um, a, enough time for the board members to, um, have, uh, you know, questions asked and answered before you get to a board meeting so that things aren't just sort of laying on you in the midst of the meeting. Um, we want you to be professional and thoughtful in your work, just as you want all the staff to be professional and thoughtful in their work and the students. And in order to do that, you need to have your materials so that you can do the homework necessary, put together the, um, you know, the questions as well. Um, so that these meetings are very informative about the reality for students in the district. Um, and st that we can keep the focus on that. So unity and trust, um, there are a few things we could get here that have to do mostly with if we get some board operating procedures um, on paper. What we would like to do is probably get a um, begin this work in January, um, put together a small committee just to get the work, you know, a draft done and then have the full board um, review that. So um, that is planned for 25. Um, board included language in its ethics and conflicts of interest statement requiring that board members do not give operational advice or instructions to staff members. This is one that I can think of relapse with your board guardrails as well. So, um, you know, again, what is going to be like, how are y'all going to, you know, like hold each other to uh, meeting these standards is another conversation you need to have. Um, and then the last one here has to do with the continuous improvement. We want to um, make sure that you're doing a, um, the time use ones is, um, consistently 
and there needs to be again some home some visible way that the community can see that you're doing these things so what does that look like to you know how is that evidence to the public um this one board tracks the average annual cost of staff time invested in governance during its annual self-evaluation so once a year you would have a bigger self-evaluation than just this quickie um but that you would have a, um, you know, here's the bill, here's the bill for all the time the administration has spent, you know, with governance. Um, and that is something that you all have to, you know, come to thoughtful conclusion about whether that was worth it or not. Um, you also should um, have time. And I think board member, uh, board president Cotman brought this one up. Board provided time during the regularly scheduled board authorized public meetings to recognize the accomplishment of its students and staff regarding progress towards goals and interim goals. Um, so when you say that you're gonna focus on student outcome goals, then those are the things that you can highlight at your board meetings, you know, like the student was awesome, they kicked it out of the park on, you know, X, Y, or Z assessment for sixth grade numeracy. Um, so making sure that, you know, like those are pieces that are incorporated in your meeting is very healthy. Um, so, uh, this one, a very easy one to do. I don't know if anybody's um, into decorating or whatnot, but having your goals and all of your targets and like your data room, like having that information where you can all see it, like in the um, in your meeting room there, but making sure that, you know, these are not hollow words or complicated conversations once a month when, you know, we happen to be on the call with each other. Making sure that these are things that start to get, you know, that are lived and breathed and um, that your staff is not frustrated because the board's, you know, oh, we did all that work and then we don't see it evidenced anywhere. So it's just a um, matter of being present and consistent and, um, you know, thorough with what you say you're going to do um, and making sure that that comes through in your actions. So that's what all of this work is about. Um, is there any what, what I would love for y'all to do is to adopt um, or to accept, agree to accept the evaluation and it's based on what you have right now. So if y'all would please go back and look through that and then we could um, propose that be on the agenda for approval at the next meeting. Fantastic. Any questions? I don't see any hands. a lot of work it's a stun day yeah it's definitely a shift for all of us yep so all i right. have a question leslie mm -hmm. when you were looking at this you were talking about the superintendent is only evaluated on um student outcome are you talking about no operational nothing other than student outcome is part of her evaluation under your system? Um, your recommendation? Uh, the recommendation again, is that if you want the district to focus on improving student outcomes solely, like, I mean, mm -hmm. that's what we say, school systems exist, only exist to improve student outcomes. All of the other things are, you know, necessary, absolutely critically necessary, but the reason school systems exist is to improve student outcomes. Um, then yes, that would be the thing you hold the superintendent accountable for is making sure that those um, goals and guardrails for um, student outcome goals, I'm sorry, not the guardrails, student outcome goals are met. Leslie, mm -hmm. when we went through the course work and we just graduated, when you taught us, you said that we had to devote at least 50% a board time to these goals and these guardrails, but you acknowledge that by state law, we have to pass a budget. We have to hire a superintendent. We have to uh, allocate resources so even our goals and guardrails can be implemented. So Mike, before Sharon asked that question, I was going to say to you, are, are you saying that evaluations such as the brilliant way the superintendent got us over a $289 million cliff when we lost the extra money, that finances and operation does not, it's not absolutely necessary to be included in the evaluation. Um, again, it depends on what you're valuing, right? Like if you're, you know, your ultimate thing, 
all of those things are absolutely necessary. Like you cannot, you know, function in the district without a healthy financial, you know, framework. Um, what I am suggesting, and specifically with now, would be that um, anything you are requiring the superintendent to be held accountable for in next uh, July, August, when you have her evaluate September, when you have her evaluation, she should understand that now. So whatever it is, it's not something that's coming in, flying in hot at the last minute. A, that's one, is that it has to be, you know, like it should be understood right now. Um, but again, the second one in your, the 50% has to do with what we would love is that every time you convene yourselves and the staff's use of time, 50%, half of that time is focused on understanding the reality for your students focusing on those student outcome goals or interim goals that the student outcomes are what you're paying attention to. That speaks volumes to your community about what the board prioritizes, what the superintendent is therefore prioritizing in the system. Um, yes, there are things, I mean, there's always going to be, there's going to be a giant cons uh, consent agenda that the board legally has to approve. There are many things that are legally um, part of being a board member that aren't necessarily uh, you know, just paying attention to student outcomes or we'd say, hey, hit 100. Um, you do have obligations. That's why we're saying 50% is a great starting point. We would love you to get to 80%. Um, but, uh, and that also actually happens to be one of your board guardrails that y'all adopted as well. Um, but we're, you know, we're ways away from that. And I just don't think that's, you know, that doesn't need to be, that's not a criticism at all. That is a, like, you know, Let's look at what's out there on the horizon. What can we shoot for? What is the North Star for this board? If you want to do this work, if you want to do it with Fidelity, if you want it to, you know, become um, a way that you're perceived in your professionalism, then let's do that. Let's shoot for 50. Okay, I'm just saying that um, what I was always taught, you know, I'm always the finance person. Your budget, where you put your money is, is your priorities. It and, is. So and, you, and you also taught us that we have to bring the budget to our goals. Yeah. The conversation, the conversation around the budget should have to do with the inquiry is, these are the goals that we have set. And now that you've set goals, these are the goals we have set for the superintendent. Please explain to us in, you know, like no uncertain terms, how these align with the goals and guardrails we've set. That should be the conversation about the budget. Um, if there's other things that are going on that are, you know, we talked about this, other things that are going on around, you know, individuals on the board trying to direct funds different places, um, that gets in the way of the superintendent's accountability for the, making sure the budget works for the things the board has told her they want them to work for. So there's all kinds of ways to tie knots around this. So y'all be careful. Yeah, and I know districts across this country um, do adopt the goals and guardrails, and that's part of that is the superintendent's um, eva part of her evaluation. But there's other uh, parameters that are also included, and so that's one of the reasons why we need to um, look at that and and not be blind her, for her not to be blindsided yeah. with that, as you mentioned. Correct. Us. Yes. Yeah. Very respectful way to manage your HR function of the board is to um, have those expectations very clear. Don't, you know, switch on them. Make sure that, you know, what you're hiring me to do this year is clearly stated. Um, I will do it if you give me the keys to run the, you know, to do it. And um, let's track the progress along the way. But you're hiring her for this job for this year and she needs to understand exactly what that is. So. Um, any more questions? Mm -hmm. I know it's a lot tonight, so I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, all right. Um, the, we threw a lot at you. There's a lot of, um, dates coming up, some timelines, some needs from each of you. Um, Kathy, Dr. Evans Brown will follow it up or, um, board member McKechn. Um, uh, and if there's anything you want to know from me, please always reach out. Um, we are, uh, it's a crunch time. I'll be out for a couple of weeks, early December, but um, so I would love to, you know, if you have any questions or whatever in the next week or two, holler at me, let's get on the phone. Let's talk or walk through this very slowly. If you want, I can, happy to do that, okay? 
right? Leslie, this is Will. I'll reach out to you to get your best availability for that January retreat, okay? okay. Yep, that sounds great. I really appreciate it. Good good luck you did real good. You did real good. It's only an hour and five minutes, so thank you. Okay. But go ahead. You want to wrap it up? Are you, Cindy, are you wrapping up? Was that to me? I thought that was to you. Oh. To both of you. Oh. Well, I mean, I think Leslie did wrap it up. If you do have further questions, because we certainly did give a lot of information, um, feel free to reach out to her. I'll just reiterate that. But there'll be a lot of information coming, and I just encourage you to make sure you're checking your emails. Yeah, please check your emails. When I do send one to everybody, I know you don't want to reply all, but you can individually reply to me if you have a question. Um, sometimes I'm not sure if they just go into the black box of who is this person or whatnot, but um, just make sure, you know, if there's something that coming from me, you're paying attention to it. Um, if you need a, you know, if we need to set up a individual meeting, I would be very happy to do that. Okay. And that website, don't, don't not go to the implementation website. Um, anybody needs that, I will send you an email in a minute. Okay. Let's see that, that, that video that we shot in Dallas, is that available? um publicly for all the board members i wasn't sure if you sent it to all the board um members. we haven't sent it anywhere i'm happy to send that link to you as well y'all both have the link if you have a link you can share it okay it's just perfect. not it's not searchable on youtube but all right i thought it was really good so mm -hmm. with that said this wraps up our um executive committee executive committee meeting um you all have a safe um, and prosperous night. We will see you <laughs> soon because you all look tired. <laughs> a long week. A long Thank week. You. Okay. Take care. Have a good one. Bye bye. Be bye. safe, Wendy. Be safe.